North Carolina has always had a rich musical heritage and we're proud to be a part of such a great treasure. Join Brooke and I as we talk to some of our favorite musicians and good friends from our home state of North Carolina. Hear their story and see how bluegrass music has shaped their lives and their career. Well, welcome to another Carolina Sessions. Uh, we are so excited to have Andrew Marlin with us today. Andrew, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we've done probably about 11 or 12 of these now mm -hmm. and uh, have had a lot of great feedback from them. So we were real excited to get you. Uh, we know that you guys have been doing great things in the music business. And uh, if you would kind of start telling us about where you grew up and uh, just, you know, kind of your musical background a little bit. Yeah, I, uh, I grew up in Warrington, North Carolina, which is uh, right on the Virginia line. Um, if you ever been to Lake Gas or Car Lake, that's my my neck of the woods there. Um, so yeah, I grew up um, mainly just hearing a lot of piano music and latched onto that. My grandma was a really great piano player, and my mom and my sister, and so yeah, just heard a lot of old hymns. You know, they both uh, my grandma played for the church, and then my mom ended up taking over for her, and you know, so I would. Um, hear mom working on these hymns, you know, throughout the week that she was going to play on Sunday. And it was really cool. She would work all these, um, all these great hymns together. You know, sometimes she would transpose the keys so that um, she could just get these big medleys going, you know, and yeah. uh, that always just amazed me the way she was able to string it all together. And so I think, I think a lot of those melodies and a lot of those rhythms and harmonies just work themselves into how I think about music. So, um, and I, ne I never did take piano lessons. I wish I had, but, uh, but yes, yeah, so I think I picked up the guitar when I was about 14 and just started writing right from the get. And, you know, I was, didn't have the attention span to, to learn other people's songs yet. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but that was how I taught myself the guitar, you know, one finger at a time, I would just come up with these little melodies using my index finger and using a lot of open strings. And then eventually I got to where I could use two fingers and, three and and then somebody was came up to me I think it was my buddy Rick who I bought the guitar from was like you know you can you can learn chords you know we could teach you some chords and I was like cool yeah go ahead so he taught me a G chord you know and from there it was just you know, yeah yeah so um but yeah but I, I didn't really come to acoustic music for a while you know it was around uh there was this place called the Ridgeway Opry House uh Ridgeway is only about it's about three miles up the road from Warrington and uh, every Friday and Saturday they would have an opera style show at this tiny little gathering there at the Ridgeway Opera House and I remember I think I was like 16 or 17 uh, me and some buddies of mine were headed to Henderson North Carolina and you can go two ways you can go up a thousand one or you can take US one and so we took US one and Ridgeway Opera House is right on the side of US one and we saw all these folks sitting outside playing dobros and banjos and guitars and we decided to stop. And I remember when we got done listening to them for a little while, we got in the car and went to Henderson and we were all just like, what the hell was that? That was awesome. You know, it's like all these people sitting around and playing these songs and we would ask them, you know, how long they've been practicing together. And they're like, oh, we just know the same songs, you know, so we were just, just playing. And I think it was then the, the concept of, of what you were able to do with bluegrass and old time music finally called on. It was like, oh, okay. So basically you learn this language and you learn these tunes and you kind of dip into the same sources that everybody else is, is drawing from. And then when you get together, you can just play an infinite amount of songs. And that, that really blew my mind as somebody who was writing original music and not really able to sit down and play those songs with other people. Right. How old were you about that time? I think it was about 16 or 17. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's still, it was a few years yet before I picked up the mandolin. I picked up the mandolin when I was 19, and that was when it really, I started learning fiddle tunes and a lot more like Bill Monroe, Carter Family, Stanley Brothers tunes. Um, but yeah, up until that point, I was still playing a lot of like heavy metal and rock and roll, so yeah. Right. Who did you like in the metal bands and rock and roll stuff? Um, I was, I think early on Led Zeppelin really caught me and, you know, uh, Leonard Skinner, obviously, you know, yeah. um, being from North Carolina, you, you can't help but love them. And, uh, That's right. but then I remember early on with, uh, 
Well, actually, Metallica was a really big influence on what I did. And I think what they were doing musically still really relates uh, to fiddle music because it's all these riffs that are thrown together and the structures they kept, you know, even though it was, it was very experimental what they were doing, they, they arranged their songs in a way where you could almost clearly lay out like an A and a B part. And so once you understood that structure, a lot of their songs all of a sudden unfolded for you. Um, and so it's funny learning those riffs and kind of getting used to the fretboard based on what they were doing prepared me for like fiddle tunes and you know what Tony Rice does and sure uh, Nor like and all those guys so yeah it's all relatable you know it's just where you take it and whether you're running through a cranked amp or not I reckon uh, I would I would agree with you on that I studied a lot of that type of music too uh what was your favorite Metallica album man oh man um uh, I mean probably Master of Puppets that one uh I feel like that was that was the, especially the tone of that record you know I, I think they were getting close to that on each record and then finally when master puppets hit they had they had figured out what they were going to bring to the table you know yeah yeah i like that one ride the light and then the black album you know got a little bit more commercial but it had some great songs on it too yeah and justice for all was also i remember uh there were some really what was that one song? Um, yeah, one of those <laughs> <forever. laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> and so I, you know, would pick up the guitar and play that riff there, you know. So right, yeah, just like Bill Cheatham. <laughs> <laughs> no different, just you know, same <laughs> notes, just in different orders. <laughs> well, what was first couple guys? I guess was it those guys you traveled with in the car that day that you might have started picking like old time and bluegrass music with, or did y'all form a a band someone at that time no i i kind of went off on my own there and uh i started going over to this guy's house frankie blaylock is his name and uh he had been friends of my family for a long time you know and uh had been playing music with you know around the area for a long time but i'd never really gone over there and uh every friday night he and some folks would get together and play music and so I started going over there and that's what they were playing, you know, a lot of Carter family tunes. And I remember he showed me, buried me beneath the willow tree for the first time. And it was like, ah, oh, this is beautiful. Where's this song been my whole life? You know? Uh -huh. So I think that was the first one I learned. Um, but yeah. He, he started turning me on to a lot of records like, uh, you know, that Skaggs and Rice record, which is where he got um, buried me beneath the willow tree. And uh -huh. you know, a lot of uh, also like railroad earths, you know, so kind of taking, taking, you know, all of these old tunes and, in a much more jammy direction. So, yeah, I, I think it was probably over there with Frankie where I started playing the music and actually just trying to improvise a little more. Um, but then I moved to Chapel Hill when I was 20. Um, I lost my mom when I was 18. She came up here to UNC hospitals and I just latched on to the area. You know, I think I felt like I lost something here. So I wanted to come back and find it, you know? And, and so, yeah, I've been, been here in Chapel Hill ever since and there's a guy Jerry Brown who owns the rubber room studio um mm -hmm. kind of took me under his wing and told me taught me a lot about you know guitar playing and cross picking and Norman Blake and um you know really turned me on to Bill Monroe I think before before moving here I couldn't get past how chaotic some of the Bill Monroe records sounded especially on those uh those you know twin fiddling records um but I think he kind of taught me how to listen to it and, and pick it apart. And, and from there, it was just like, you know, a spark was lit and I wanted to learn all the Bill Monroe songs I could, all the Bill Monroe licks I could and like how he was thinking about the music. So um, that was when moving to Chapel Hill, when I really latched on to bluegrass music and what that meant. Yeah. When did y'all put uh, Mandolin Orange together, man? Um, soon after moving here, I think I was 21 and so was Emily when we met each other. We, um, were friends with this band called the Big Fat Gap. You know, we both had, um, connections with them just separately. I'd, I'd never met Emily before, but I guess she had played on, on and off with them. And I had recently just been thrown into the mix with them because their mandolin player left and they needed a mandolin player and I they heard that I was interested in mandolin, but I didn't really play the mandolin yet, but they put one in my hands. And so I would just chop along, you know, and, and, you know, get all tense when it was time for me to take a break and <laughs> just 
bomb it so bad, but, uh, but I learned a lot and uh, it, it forced me to really sit down and figure out how to relax at high tempos and, uh, you know, and, and just how to think about, you know, what it means to be in a band as a mandolin player. Um, but so they had this weekly jam every Tuesday at the Armadillo Grill and there was no, no microphones, you know, no, uh, no PA, it was just all acoustic. So you also had to figure out how to play with volume and, you know, at high tempos, which is tough, uh, especially um, because, you know, I would go sit down with Jerry and he would be telling me all about tone. And so it's like, you know, how to match volume and tone together is a, I feel like a constant battle when you're playing in a bluegrass jam. Um, but so I sat down, Emily came up one night, it was actually inauguration day, 2009, it had snowed. And so she didn't have any classes. So she came to the jam and I remember she walked up the stairs and she came through the to the door and I was just like, damn, who is this person with a fiddle on the back, you know? Um, and so she sat down and we, we started playing and it was cool to have a fiddle that day, you know, we, d we didn't always have a fiddle then, but she and I knew a bunch of the same songs. So we ended up singing a bunch of harmonies that night together and then didn't, didn't want it to stop. So we went to the bar next door and danced all night and hung out. And so, yeah, uh, yeah, that was kind of our coming together, you know, it was very, I don't know. It was, Hard to, hard to describe. It was a, it was a magical evening. <laughs> it was just meant to be. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it felt like it. And we, we definitely, uh, you know, took that moment and held on to it for as long as we could that evening and kept getting up together and going up to the jams every Tuesday and getting together outside of that to play as well. So. I know. Yeah. How did, how did you come up with the name Mandolin Orange? Uh, I had a really crappy orange mandolin in the beginning <laughs> and, uh, it made sense, you know, we, um, so we, we went with that. We needed something to call ourselves. We had no idea that 11 years later, we'd still be using the name, you know, but. Yeah. I remember seeing you guys the first time at Girl <clears throat> Fest mm -hmm. and uh, I, I hadn't really been introduced to your music that much yet. And Darren was really bragging on you guys and you were on the cabin stage. And uh, I was like, wow, they're awesome. You know, and Darren was like, yeah, he's like, I've been following them for a long time. So, um, so it was really neat to kind of, to hear you guys and then see how you've really taken off, you know, just in the yeah, last 10 years or so. Really busy since then. <laughs> but uh, I remember how nervous we were on that stage, on the cabin stage too, you know, we looked out and it was mainly, I feel like all I could really see was family members, but uh, <laughs> but sometimes playing for your family is the most nerve wracking anyways. Um, oh, yeah. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, the way Merle Fest does that cabin stage, you can hear yourself so well because those main speakers right to the right, are just blasting past you um but yeah i remember that day and when i talked about it after the set and it was like god we've never sounded so big it was wild you know <laughs> we were just taking over the field so yeah that was a really fun set that's a good style we had that moment too one time didn't we? We did. early on yeah. <laughs> i was performing with the circuit riders at, at that time for merle fest and one of our band members his dad had passed and the funeral was that weekend and they they just couldn't go so me and brooke was dating and i pulled her up on stage with us that very first weekend yeah and uh, got to hear that across the big speakers that was something wasn't it? that was and then jim lauderdale sat in with us as well that's right you know how that is with jim you'll, <laughs> you'll rehearse something and say you're going to do two or three songs and he changes his mind like that on stage yeah you gotta be willing to go with it <laughs> Brooke said, I don't know this song. I'm not singing. I said, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> it's going to put that mic over your face. <laughs> it, it worked out fine. <laughs> so. um, what bluegrass festivals and stuff in Carolina have you been to since, you know, you got into it so well that there were big bluegrass festivals besides like Merle Fest or something? Yeah, we haven't done too many bluegrass festivals. I think we were always scared to do it because we were doing such sentimental music, you know, and uh, and but I think, uh, you know, because I've, I've always heard about like Bass Mountain and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, festivals of that caliber. And it, it's not something that we ever really did, you know, not not on not on principle, just kind of. Sure. You know, I uh, mean, maybe before y'all started or why you started, did you ever go just to kind of jam with people and stuff like that to any any festivals around? No, it's one of those things where uh, right when I started playing the music is right when she and I started playing together and booking gigs so it was right like, the start just got busy you know and kind of got my feet wet by just doing it um you know and so 
you know, we were going to Shikori Hills a lot. Um, and I know one of the festivals that was really good for us in the beginning was the Ochre Folk Festival. Have y'all been to that one? Mm -hmm. I don't know, Ochre Coke Island. It's great. Um, Ochre Coke's such a wonderful community there, you know, really tiny on the off season, but on the on season, there's just people coming from all over and especially during the festival. And so I think that helped us get, you know, gain a lot of ground and, and, and just introduce ourselves to a lot of people that were widespread. And so then they would go and, and, you know, tell folks they knew. And so as we traveled more around North Carolina and kind of outside of North Carolina, all these people were coming up to us and saying like, Hey, we saw you at the Ochre Folk Festival, you know, and um, like even as far North as like New York or even beyond, you know, people, I think really dig that festival. So wow. that was, that was a good, a good one for us in the beginning. Um, I'm trying to think of some more. I wish I, I don't have a mind for those kind of things. Emily can tell you the date that we <laughs> played somewhere and like, you know, what the weather was like, but, uh, well, but yeah, for the last days. several years, you've been hanging around, uh, Mr. Edwards there and Tony Williamson and some great bluegrass legends like that. I know they've taught you a lot of things over the years too, correct? Yeah. And yeah, Tony and Tommy both, you know, sitting down with them each time you pick is just a, is a lesson, you know, whether they're teaching you something or not. Um, and they also, you know, back to tone, you know, they, uh, they both have their hands on a lot of great instruments and are willing to share those. And so it's, it's cool getting to play those and, and understanding, you know, the history of, and, and what those great instruments did for the music during those times, you know, um, you know, I think, you know, if you think about Bill Monroe, you think about a Lloyd Lore Gibson. And then when you finally play one, it's like, oh yeah, there's the sound, you know, that's, right. you know, obviously a lot of it is, was Bill's hands, but then also, you know, just how capable those instruments are. Yeah. And you got to uh, purchase one of them a couple of years back, right? Oh, I did. Yeah. I had to sell a bunch of them to get it too, but, but it's, it, it does what all of those did separately all in one instrument. So I guess it makes right. sense. I don't have to go back and forth between them and wonder which one to play. So that's, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, they've got a, a whole voice and mind of their own. You know, it's, I got to play one for many years. A good friend of mine in Charlotte had one that I give lessons to and uh, he just pretty much gave me to play mm. because it needed to be played and he didn't play anymore. And he was a great mentor of mine. And actually Tony still got it now cause he's recently passed and well, no, he was selling it for a little while, but his son uh, grabbed it back up and wanted to kind of keep it in the family. Cool. It was a February 26, 1923. Lord. Mm. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a third dimension that comes with them that a lot of times you have a lot of volume on the surface of really great, you know, modern mandolins, but, Something about the lures to me, it's like, I don't know if they were built into it or if time has just put it there, but there's some, there's a lot going on behind the surface as well. Um, and it just creates a lot of depth in the music that you're playing when you, when you have one of these in your hand. Absolutely. I know you've produced a lot of records over the last, what, five or six years too. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I've been fortunate to work with some great folks. Um, one of my favorites was the songwriter, Kate Rudy from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, great songwriter and, you know, an incredible performer and singer. But it always just blows my mind when people are willing to pull me in on their projects, you know, and, and kind of let me, you know, be a part of that. And, you know, and, and again, talk about learning, you know, you learn so much by sitting in with these folks and, and hearing how they approach music and how they think about it. But, um, but yeah, I've been, been trying to do a little bit of producing as well, you know, during quarantine um, in a way that makes sense, you know, and like in the safe, but also still gives me something to do. So Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's been cool. We've been following you on that and, and reading about that. I know I, I, I got the uh, fretboard journal. It was, um, was it last year when that came out on y'all? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually Brooke was down in Durham for a conference and I was just kicking around goofing <laughs> off and I went in one of the Barnes and Nobles and there you was. I said, Hey, I know them. <laughs> so it gave me some good reading material that day. Oh yeah. Well, hopefully you weren't too bored by it, you know, yeah, that was great. Was and articles that have been in the fretboard journal. <laughs> talking about the, uh, the instruments and this y'all's journey. It's been quite the journey. And I know, man, 
talking to our mutual friend over the years, Jimmy Ryan, and he's uh, what tour manager for y'all. Is that right? Yeah, we're just manager, but he has tour managed a little bit too. And uh, yeah, Jimmy, we've been with him for about eight years, I guess. Um, and he's just part of the family, you know, is uh, an, an incredible, incredible mind, brilliant guy and works super hard, you know, works harder than Emily and I do. And I think, I think that matters a lot in a manager. Um, so, and it's just somebody that, you know, we're, we're very fortunate if something's going on in our minds and we're freaking out or if we are like, are really excited about an idea and want to start, you know, start the ball rolling there. Um, you can call him up at any hour and he, he'll pick up the phone and say, what's up, what's happening, you know, <laughs> trying to figure it out with you. So. Very good to have. I always thought he was a brilliant young man. I give him guitar lessons when he was uh, going to high school in Lincoln. I see. I don't know about this. I don't know. Oh, about yeah. 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 Jim plays guitar. That's how we first met. He come over when he was, well, his dad brought him over. So he wasn't driving yet. Yeah. When I first met him and I taught him until he went to college for cool. a couple of years and he'd bring me the, the coolest tunes to figure out and learn, you know, different things that I'd never sat down to learn before, you know, all kind of folk tunes or uh, authentic Beatles song or whatever, you know, and I taught him a lot of bluegrass and flat picking tunes as well, but we all mixed it together. Cool. So he had first told me about y'all. I wonder if he still yeah. picks much, you know. I know he's got good timing on the keyboard, you know, so was, <laughs> he must have some music in there somewhere. That's <laughs> right. He's a great guy. Well, yeah. man, I would say digital music has been a huge plus for y'all, wouldn't you? Can you talk about that in, in today's world of Spotify and Pandora and everything? Um, so what was the first part of that question? My daughter's banging around upstairs. I couldn't hear you. Um, um, digital music has been a, a huge plus for y'all and, and music in general this day and time. And uh, Spotify and Pandora and Apple Music and Amazon. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The way sure, you yeah. think about it? Um, well, Jimmy would be the one to really like pick apart the details um, and how that's been um, kind of approached, you know, but uh but I do know that we've been fortunate to be on a bunch of playlists on Spotify and, uh, you know, and just, just being thrown in with a lot of other great artists making, making music, you know, and I think when it's cool when you see us, you know, right, right next to a Sturgill Simpson song or something like that, you know, and, and so I'm sure people are going to listen to Sturgill, but if they happen to listen to us too, then we, yeah, well, man, I don't know. A lot of people I talked to went to listen to Man on Orange and then they find other people. Cool. <laughs> On there. So, so you know some of my family members um but uh but yeah no it's been great and I, I think more more and more folks are able to finally hear hear people that didn't have a voice before you know i mean if, you know there are a lot of folks out there that are doing well on a digital platform that don't necessarily have the resources to hit the road or like really get their names out there in front of people touring so um and i think you know, if you take like 20 years ago, it was more about selling CDs on the road and albums on the road and, and actually touring and having to have a little more infrastructure for that kind of thing. So, right. um, yeah, it's leveled the playing field a lot. And, you know, I, I do think you make less money on, on digital downloads, but the, the listenership increases so much that I, I think it kind of evens out a little bit. So, and it's here to stay. So I think we all have to, just figure out our, our place in that world. You know? I would agree. Sure enough. Well, we asked all of our guests what they think about the Carolina style of uh, bluegrass and music. So can you give us your thoughts on that today? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can give it to you in, in terms of what it's done for me, you know, and uh, the folks that I've met and, you know, I think, I think at least with the people that I've met and, and play with, it's, it's very much inclusive it, and it doesn't, uh, I don't think it really adheres to a, a strict way of playing any instrument. You know, I think it's very, uh, you know, if you can, if you can keep time and you can sing then you can sit down and play, you know, play bluegrass or old time or any of that. Um, but I'm sure there's I'm sure there's musicologists that can tell you exactly what the North Carolina sound is. But for me, it's more of a feeling and more of a vibe, and um, and that's that's what I've taken from it, and that's what I try to bring when I sit down with people is 
Because, you know, if you've got a washboard or if you've got a an old shoe that you like to beat on, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. It's like if you can keep time and you're and you can think about the song when you're doing it, then uh then I I think it goes and that's what I've learned so far from the North Carolina music scene. Right. And it means something a little different to everybody and but it's been a good good thing to hear everybody's point of view on that. And uh being that I've got to pick with you over the years a couple times and uh, I remember the first time we really got to talk was up at, at Merle Fest. It was later a uh, different time we was performing there together, but it was the midnight jam. And yeah, we were in the hallway and you called me into y'all's room to, to jam some. And I'd, I'd heard you a bunch, but never heard you play this traditional bluegrass. It's just been y'all's tunes, you know, and man, we broke into some, some rice tunes and some different things. And I was thinking in my head, these kids have got it right. <laughs> we got uh, singing and playing, and then of course got to jamming with Tony a couple different times over some mandolins and stuff, and we was really impressed. Well, likewise, man. It's always a good time, and uh, yeah, that's my problem with the midnight jam is all those folks are around to play music. I always forget to step out in front of the microphones. I'm just trying to pick as much as I can backstage. Yeah, <laughs> um, but. But yeah, I remember that time, and that we we did play some really good tunes. That was a good time. So yeah. hopefully we can do it again soon without a mask on and hug it out and be safe and all that good stuff. You know? I hope so for sure. Well, man, we sure enjoyed it this morning. We appreciate your time and talking with us, folks. Go check out Manlin Orange. They've got great songwriting, some great instruments they pick on, and they're a wonderful duet out there. And uh, it's just a good thing here this morning on the Carolina Sessions. Yeah. Thank you again, buddy. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. It's good to see y'all. You too. See you. See you.